Hello and welcome to Retech and today we're going to discuss a laptop, a laptop from a very well-known manufacturer called Toshiba who was at one time the best maker arguably of laptops in the entire world and the reason I say this it comes from a time of experience I had a lot to do with these laptops back in the mid 19 90s and it was around about the time that the um, whole proper laptop kind of explosion happened and um, Toshiba were very well known for producing some of the best LCD panels at the time you see you got to remember that at the time if you had a couple of dead pixels on a panel that was deemed acceptable and it was deemed acceptable by most manufacturers now Toshiba um, changed that a little bit because they they had a kind of a, a single dead pixel kind of rating on their screen so they would actually do something about it and then at the same time you have to remember that most manufacturers were using kind of CS screens if you've ever seen a, a vintage laptop where the cursor and all the graphics ghost around the screen that was generally a CS laptop where you could actually adjust the contrast on a wheel generally as well. That's one of the giveaways. But um, this laptop was massively expensive. It was equivalent to seven and a half thousand US dollars in today's money or almost three and a half thousand dollars at the time and that was way way back in 1994 and I actually remember things like memory memory for these laptops was ridiculously expensive for the the smallest upgrade you'd pay one and a half this is UK pounds one and a half thousand pounds plus VAT or taxes as um, it's known in most of the parts of the world just for a very small increase in memory these were insane prices now the gap between the sort of mid 80s to the early to mid 90s wasn't that huge you, you're looking at around about a six to an eight year gap so why did laptops of the time suddenly cost as much as a small family car of the time it seems a bit strange really when you think about it because HC models from Epson were kind of costing under £500 and that was for something that was technologically advanced at the time. So move it on six, seven years, you've got laptops costing thousands of pounds and yet in that short period of time people's salaries and you know people's income didn't raise in line with the massive jump in cost and I, that always kind of confused me at the time because there were a lot of other manufacturers out there who were cutting the costs such as AST and Compaq and so on and yet Toshiba were trading on their name or reputation for quality and that's all I could put it down to but but it was a deserved reputation at the time for quality and a deserved reputation overall for its laptops because Toshiba isn't the Toshiba that it is now it was very innovative in the times of the release of these laptops and um, it went all the way up to its premium premium models and which were the Tecra series so today we're going to look at what would be a seven thousand dollar laptop today and to be honest equivalent in uk pounds and euros it's a seven thousand euro or seven thousand pound laptop let's take a look at this laptop that was the price of a small family car back in 1994. Size. So what we have here is a quite a nice hard case. I mean, it is a genuine Toshiba case which came with the laptop. All of what you see here was original Toshiba. It's um, exactly how it would come 
out of the box when you bought one of these laptops although i don't have the box for this machine but it's been very well packaged in this case for many a decade judging by the the dust on the case so you're going to ask well what's in the case well initially you have a storage pouch which is where the manuals used to be in this case itself and then you have a section here which unscrews for your main laptop which we'll come to in a second this at the time was a very very slim line very very svelte machine now it weighs an absolute ton you wouldn't want to lug this about as your daily driver um, and it's chunky to say the least it's very very chunky when you compare it to modern laptops but there's a reason for that and one of the biggest reasons is the built-in floppy drive which you don't see anymore on modern laptops and that reduces the thickness of the cases but we'll come to that in a second so we're just going to spin this case around and I'm just making sure I haven't missed anything in the case so in the other pocket we have things that you don't see very often today and I'm glad it actually comes with this it's an Ethernet 3 link these sold like absolute hotcakes at the time because everybody wanted to connect their laptops to a network and this is a 10 base T and it's also for coax as well so it's a it's a 3com LAN PC card for 10 base T and coax and these were relatively expensive at the time and as you can see nothing's really changed you've still got your address on here etc so um, all of this is kind of pretty standard fare today and something you don't see today is a 2800 modem by us robotics a sportster version no doubt and um it's these were quite a nice modem of the time you know everything at the time that you would tend to buy modem wise were generally us robotics um almost everything i bought in the sort of mid to late 90s and to be honest into the early 2000s were us robotics based comms kit whether it was a modem or whether it was a a hub or it was later on it was a switch it was all us robotics and they kind of filtered out and disappeared in kind of later years but you know it's kind of a blast from the past now this whole machine's a blast from the past really we have um, a Toshiba power supply and these power supplies are pretty hungry as far as voltage goes it's um, 18 volts DC uh, this is a switchable power supply so it basically it's the same for every market you go in 100 to 240 volts and um, these were very very robust and they were quite cool running adapters as well they never seem to get massively hot which is a good thing especially when you're considering using them for a laptop but it's a big chunky unit to add to your laptop and then you have to remember time before trackpads this is a trackball which clips on the side of the laptop itself and it allows you to kind of skirt the cursor around for those of you who are not sure what this is it's basically an upside down mouse so with the ball being on the top and the button still where roughly where your mouse button should be today so basically it was an inverted mouse and once you got used to it they were all right using your thumb and your fingers to select the button but it clips on the side of the the laptop so it's kind of a little bit restrictive but it was good enough for the day and this one looks in remarkably 
good condition. So it'll be nice to see if this actually does work. So that's basically what was in this very, very heavy bag from Toshiba. So we're going to have a, a look around the model now and find out exactly what it was all about. So this is your Toshiba T1910 and this one's in remarkable condition. It's virtually unmarked. It's clean as you can get. It hasn't yellowed. In fact, I think the trackball may have yellowed slightly compared when compared to the laptop, but they're both pretty good. They're both in very good condition. And the other thing is, this plastic was very, very brittle. Although I said that these machines were very, very well built at the time, they were very expensive, the plastics on them were very brittle. They always were. After a, you know, a few years of use and heat, they tend to, tended to kind of start to crack. It was almost like they were made of Bakelite, which is a bizarre thing to say, but that's how they felt. Um, and the hinges themselves, because the LCD was relatively heavy, and the hinges were relatively stiff. It always used to crack around the back of the bezel because the hinges themselves used to seize. And this one, is nice. So although it's a little creaky, it's still in very, very good condition. So this machine has a, a full travel keyboard, which is actually very nice. It's one of the type of keyboards I actually like on a laptop rather than the little kind of button style keys that was a big thing um, which Apple really put into the mainstream and a lot of other manufacturers followed. But I kind of have always preferred a nice tactile keyboard with longish travel keys so you actually know you're actually pressing the buttons, etc. But this one's quite nice to the touch and it's it obviously hasn't seen a lot of use because at the end of the day, a lot of these markings on the keys would wear off after not a very long time, to be honest. Um, and that was one of the one of the major failings of these laptops under heavy use. The actual letters would start to wear and the key tops would go very shiny. But this one is pretty much the way it left the factory. So it's a T1910, so it's the 1900 range of laptops. So on the front you have power, caps lock, you've got all of your normal overlay, number lock, disk in use, keys, battery and DC in, monitors on here, which is quite useful because it's mainly driven in software nowadays on your screen. And the screen is one of the things that made these laptops probably the best in the business which we'll come to in a little bit. So on the back of the laptop we have monitor VGA, printer port and a standard serial port which is not neatly covered by this little slide out piece. So on the side of the laptop under this flap you have a trackball fitting here. Under this flap which if you open it is a blank is actually where your PS2 connectors are for, for your keyboard and mouse, but you have to retract the trackball cover to get access to them, which is quite a nice touch. Then under here, you have a PCMCIA slot or a dual card slot, a double height card slot in here as well. So it kind of catered for everything of the day. And on the opposite side of the laptop, you have a barrel jack and a power supply. And you can also see the switches for your screen, the little latches there to open the screen. Now on the bottom, you have extendable feet which pop up. So if you wanna angle the laptop, you can just pop these feet out. So if you want a little bit more of a more comfortable resting place. The battery is under here. I don't know if the battery holds any charge. And obviously you have 
the Toshiba PA model number, which was always the case with its serial number. And it tells you it's still 18 volts at 1.1 amps, followed by your international one year warranty, which you'd kind of hope so. Uh, in the front, you have a floppy drive, which is something I mentioned before, which is actually a good thing, but it adds to the weight and the bulkiness of the machine. On later models, they took the floppy drive out, replaced it with a slimline CD-ROM drive, and you could have an external floppy drive, or both. You could have an external drop floppy drive and an external CD-ROM. So this is your basic laptop. We've got the power light flashing, it's on mains. The battery will not work, it's too old, and I will have to replace it. But the rest of the laptop is in remarkable condition. So. We're going to hit the power button, we've got the laptop coming to life, all of the lights that should be on there is on there, and we are getting a screen, and we're starting MS-DOS. Now, it is a CS mono screen, okay, so it is a mono screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in, and I'll show you what I mean about the, even the mono screens. So as you can see here, it's fantastically clear. It's a really nice sharp mono LCD panel and if you've had uh, looked at other laptops of the time with this type of screen you will find that this screen has issues on most laptops because they they have faded they ghost too much you can't see what's going on on them very well and you know it kind of induces eye strain really they're not nice to use now Toshiba were well known for their screens and their LCD panels at the time. I think at the time they were pretty much a world leader in them. And as you can see, as I said before, there, are, there will be no dead pixels on here. And I'm really surprised after 20 years or almost 20 years, there are still no dead pixels on this screen. There's no patches where it's darker or than other places or lighter than other places it's in amazing condition now the other thing you'll notice is there's two options okay there's one dos and windows option one and option two which is card and socket service it's a windows still windows still the same version as option one but what it has it has a card and socket driver for your pcm CIA socket so basically without that you wouldn't be able to access your modem or your LAN card or whatever you were putting in it so I'm just going to go through normal DOS and Windows now it does a quick extended memory check and then it should drop into the DOS prompt very shortly and as you can see it's still a very very clear screen Okay, so in the um, config and auto exec, it's running a virus check, which is good. And there we go. So that's all done. We've got nothing infected or from 1994 standards anyway. Um, okay, we've got 640k conventional. We've used 67k. So we've got a big chunk left. We've got extended memory in there. So total memory is 8192K. So it's, it's quite a reasonably specced up laptop for the time. So at the time to add something like 256 kilobytes on this um, would have cost you around about the couple of thousand pound mark, which was insane. But then memory prices have dropped significantly since these laptops were on the market. So if we do win and we'll drop into Windows and you can still see it's very, very clear, even on the camera. It's using kind of a chalkboard effect, so black on white. And it's very nice. And this machine looks like it really hasn't had a lot of use. It's all pretty much standard fare. Um, so the trackpad should see the, the mouse ghost or the pointer ghost, which is normal on a CS style screen. So it's a monochrome screen. So if we just drop these on the bar, 
Okay. Same with this, you've got normal file managers, control panel, print manager, clipboard and so on. So that's normal for this version of Windows. And then we've got the Office setup. So we've got Microsoft Office, Microsoft Word, Excel, all the normal stuff that you would find on a, pro a productivity laptop. So if you go into Word, you'll find that it's not really any different from what we do today. Um, to be completely honest, most of the productivity as in office -y style stuff that we do today, yeah, this laptop hasn't been used a lot. I be, would be surprised if there, there aren't still a few files on here from the previous user. Let's just try something like that because I will wipe the drive. So there you go. Um, that's off the previous user. It's just song lyrics so it's nothing that anyone can do anything about um, as in take any data or any information off. So there you go. You've got normal Word, version of Word. And to even the modern generation you would not realise that there's really anything different apart from the black and white screen. So yeah, um, which is nice. It works really, really well. Not keen on the trackball. But then again, I don't think there was any other options unless you plugged in a PS2 mouse. And it's the same, exactly the same for here. We have Excel. Now you're probably hearing a little bit of noise in the background off the hard drive. Now, that was pretty much normal for the day. <laughs> they weren't as quiet as modern equipment. Um, it's probably a tiny bit louder than it was when it was brand new, but not by much. They were never the quietest things in the world. So let's see if there's anything on. Open a file. And um, we'll just open that. Hopefully there's nothing on it. If it is, I'll just cut it out. But there we go. So just an example of what you can actually do with Excel at the time. So again, nothing's really massively changed in that department. You could actually use this laptop as a standalone word processor and you could then port it straight to a modern PC or even print it out directly from this laptop, especially if you wanted to keep your data secure. Let's say you were writing a novel, didn't want to to escape to the internet by accident or be uploaded to somewhere on the cloud. Um, something like this would be an ideal kind of tool to do that. Um, you know, maybe, maybe in a kind of dystopian style future, this is what we're going to end up going back to offline machines. Maybe, maybe not, maybe it's too much Battlestar Galactica and too much Blade Runner. But in all seriousness, something offline like this would be ideal to store sensitive information because there's no way you're going to get this onto a modern internet properly without some major revision. So as it is, it's a fairly secure device. But this is a T1910 and it looks like this machine was used in a healthcare sector for as I noticed it had a healthcare monitor that flagged up and that would explain a lot because very few people could afford what is the equivalent to a £7,000 laptop back in 1994. Very few home users and it had to be corporate and most of these went out to corporate and this is a very nice example of a Toshiba 1910 and it's something I will be using on and off, maybe to try out all software and so on, but it's not going to be a gaming machine. It's never going to be a gaming machine because of the screen, the uh, CS screen. And because of it, it's going to be limited to what we can actually do with it. Basically what's on this laptop is really what you're going to use with it. And that's all you're really going to use with it. You're going to use it as a productivity laptop. And that's about it. You could still sit in a coffee shop if the battery was okay and use it to write your novel on if you really wanted to. Although 
you probably only get two hours maximum if you were lucky out of a fully charged brand new battery and that's one thing I am going to do to it. I'm not going to open it up, I'm not going to mess around with it. All I'm going to do is replace the battery, which is in this slide out drawer here, for a new one because I don't want it to expand and to wreck what is ultimately a piece of history, a piece of Toshiba history, and it's also a and it's also a fantastic example of a relatively early fully fledged laptop with a usable screen with a usable battery life usable keyboard and usable trackpad everything that you would need to do your normal day-to-day -day work on so i hope you enjoyed this i hope you enjoyed this look at this toshiba 1910 there will be more on this later once i um get the parts to repair it and so on and I'll do a little bit on that and a little bit on what we can use this for. So thanks for watching, please subscribe and I hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot, see you.